Hello. Hey, Mark. Hey, Jeff. How are you doing? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Awesome. No, perfect. Um, what I am going to do is make you a co-host so you can Sounds good. And uh, there you go. And I will be, um, I'll, I'll admit everyone out of the, from the waiting room. So I'll take care of all of those uh, little administrative details so you don't have to deal with it. Sounds good. So people will start piling in. We've, we've got um, 60 registrants at the moment. And so typically we get awesome. a pile on of maybe 10 more right before the talk. So, you know, you may have a nice little crowd there. Sounds great. I will probably do a screen share before your screen share, but it's good to test it. Yeah, I'm just making sure this works for you. Uh, yeah, yeah, it looks good. Those are really see. good. Um, somebody who's going to be joining the talk in the audience already emailed his questions. So okay, <laughs> maybe I'll tell you what they are right now in case you don't want to answer them. But anyway, yeah, that sounds good. Uh, he said, I understand if he's unable to answer all the questions as they may be sensitive, but they didn't seem that sensitive. One was, I guess, are there plans to get Joby's airplanes to be quieter and compete better against Kitty Hawk and Heaviside for yeah. residential use? Okay. Yeah. Then the other question is a classic. What is the design reasoning for small aircraft not to have an airplane parachute for the whole plane, that the whole SR-22 thing? Yeah. You know, there's, of course, pros and cons to all of that. Um, yep. And often, I often argue that, well, you know, here are the pros and here are, are the cons, but the ultimate data on it are insurance statistics. And right. those that picture hasn't really emerged yet. I don't know if that's really true. I think maybe they have. But this idea of whether, you know, a parachute makes a pilot reckless because he knows he's got it and he gets in yeah. trouble. That he might not have gotten into trouble. Like, like the guy who tried to fly to Hawaii in an SR-22. Right. Yeah. Or the whole thing of crashing without control of the aircraft. Right. Right. Uh, but anyway. And then um, the other question he had is, what's, which is a good one, what's the hardest part of development on new Joby aircraft or eVTOLs, for instance, increasing range? Or is it consistency in its performance that's the hardest thing to do? Or get the price point down? You know, what are, what are yeah. the big, big problems and challenges there? So sure. I'd say all of the above probably. Yeah. Um, Some of those I'll have to keep my answers kind of vague, but I can, I can talk to all of them, I think. So. Yeah, you can speak to the EV tall field in general. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to keep general generalities, but. That's right. You can, you can criticize Kitty Hawk's aircraft all you want. So <laughs> use their uh, examples. So they're doing uh, great stuff. Anyway. So you've got water and stuff there in case you need something. Yep, all good. Whatever it is that gets you through it. <laughs> I'm sure it's water. That's right. Kerosene. Stop my yeah. screen share here. That's right. Yeah, I need to get a green screen or something. Um, yeah, Zoom can do it without a green screen, but it um, it takes a lot of computing power to do it. Yeah, it, it usually says that my computer is not compatible for that or something. So. Yeah. Yeah. Luckily, I have my brand spanking new work computer, so that can handle it already. So, yeah, like if I put on this background, it's interesting. Oh, it goes into the, uh, maybe I'll put that on there because it is kind of, it's like, yeah. yeah, I'm over here at the Golden Gate Bridge. And then That's this one cool. here, this one is causing uh, some edge detection problems yeah. Yeah. or whatever the issue is. Um, here's a little, uh, that, that one there, but this is one everyone's got, right? Yeah. This is, this is one of the default ones. That's so interesting I, that it chooses just your window to do. Like. Yeah, <laughs> that's the most, you know, pixel to pixel, same value. I don't know what it's looking at, but. Yeah, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I figured Hiller would be a good, good background to have for this. Yeah. So I'm just, uh, I'm in my office and I just threw a uh, black 
tablecloth over all my file cabinets. So nice. it's, at, least it, at least it has some presentability. Um, and then over here against the wall is the flag of the mythical country Costaguana. If you've ever read the book Nostromo by Joseph Conrad. So I haven't yet. That was the mythical country that had the silver mine in the book. And so oh, that's awesome. Not only do I have the flag, see the, uh, I have a deed from the silver mine right next to it. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> that's fantastic. Very few people ask me about it. But, so I <laughs> forced to tell people about it, whether they want to know or not. That's very cool. I'll have to check out that book sometime. <laughs> it is, it's pretty cool. I mean, I like this, the idea, the, the gist of the story is, is um, a very trusted man in this mythical South American town in the late 19th century um, is entrusted with all the, all the silver from the silver mine during a revolution to keep the, the rebels from stealing it. Uh, he's told to sail it out to an island and where they won't get, get to it and his boat sinks. Oh, geez. Now, everybody... Everybody figures, oh, poor Nostromo, you know, he did his best. He tried to, you know, he swam back to shore. But what he didn't tell everybody is that he actually was able to salvage most of the silver and he buried it on the island. But everyone thinks that it's sunk. That's fantastic. So, so now he has this fortune in silver in his possession. And, he, and his challenge is, I have to grow rich slowly. <laughs> Does not erase suspicion. Yes, so that's a, that's a pretty clever premise for a story. Yeah, that's a great book. I think people have tried to turn it into, well, there was a BBC miniseries on, on it once in the 90s, but people have tried to turn it into a film and it's, uh, it's hard. Yeah, that never works out quite as well as when the book's that oh, and, it, and it was written in like 1910 or something and it, it was way ahead of its time. It has all of the, it's like an HBO Westworld episode. It goes into the future and then it goes into the past. It's non-linear, like, like Pulp Fiction. Oh, and very cool. It's in 1910 though is when it was written. So That's really cool. So it's way ahead of its hard time. To, uh, hard to capture that. So most people just pull the plot out of it and don't try to recreate the narrative of the book because sure. it's a strange experience reading it. <clears throat> yeah, that's really cool. I'll have to check that out. I've just been trying to get through my library of uh, airplane books recently. So <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's right. I haven't been able so to I, throw fiction in there uh, at this point. But yeah, I, I need to throw a couple of fiction in. That's right. So that'll be good. Oh, good. So do you have any colleagues, friends, or your significant other tuning in to? <clears throat> uh, yeah, yeah. My, my girlfriend's right here. And then um, I think my parents are probably... My parents said that they wanted to listen in, so they, they might tune in as well. <laughs> I'm going to try to remember to press the record button so that we can record it to the Zoom cloud, if you don't mind. Yeah, no, please do. Because there are usually a few people who... Um... <laughs> there she goes. Your girlfriend did <laughs> say <laughs> Coming out of the third to fourth dimension. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Sorry. I always, you know, we, I, we don't try to advertise that we're recording it because we discovered that when we did that, nobody showed up for the talk. Yeah, <laughs> they always decide to watch it later. Yeah, so, you know, you gotta show up. It's a once in a lifetime experience. If you have uh, Jake's recorded, I, I had to miss that one. And I'd love I to, do, I to check it out. So, um, I'll, I'll send you an email, I'll write that down here. So. Yeah, that'd be great. I had him send me his uh, presentation to check it out, but um, it didn't have much information on it. So, yeah, just, no, just, just some really good a, pictures. He just had a couple of slides of C fives. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was trying to put together mine, and I was like, well, I can't. Like a lot of the Joby stuff and uh, my work at Sussman and stuff, they didn't allow pictures, so it's hard to. <laughs> Right. Hard to build no, that's, and build. that's the challenge. We understand that it's the same for every engineer and every firm. Yeah. So yeah. we'll just talk through it and I'll show the pictures that I do have. It's like getting those. Well, you know, like the, the NASA histories of the Apollo program, you know, trying to get pictures of things like the lunar module in construction and things like that. Oh, yeah. Um, it's only the NASA sanctioned pictures and that's all you can get. Well, and then there's this other thing like I was 
over at, in Memphis, Tennessee. One of our board members at, at one time here at the museum was a uh, uh, vice president at FedEx. And so he flew me out to Memphis and I watched their whole operation over a night where all, you know, 500, 727s at the time came, yes. came in in the course of 30 minutes. And then they you turned them around and put boxes back on all these different airplanes and sent them back out again um, and, and turned it around in like three hours. But yeah, no, no photography or, or videoing was allowed anywhere in that complex, but I'm pretty sure it was because you'll always catch some knucklehead employee doing something stupid with a FedEx package, and then that right. goes viral. You yeah, know, there's so, always somebody breaking the, the rule right, somewhere. Exactly. It's like taking pictures on the airport ramp. You know, there's always some baggage handler, you know, throwing suitcases around. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, they just don't want to have to have the PR problem. Not so much that there were any state secrets. It's just a room full of conveyor belts. I mean, I can't imagine there were a lot of proprietary technology at FedEx. Yeah. But, um, but there were a lot of knuckleheads. So I could imagine <laughs> that could be uh, a problem. So. Yeah, I had a, a friend today uh, who works at uh, who works at Raytheon. And he was like, yeah, I got to sit in a bunch of fighter jet cockpits today. And I was like, oh, which ones? He's like, I can't tell you. And I was like, well, then don't tease me with it. Like, <laughs> exactly. Are they, are they in production fighter jets or ones that are being built? Yeah, I, I was able to get him to hint enough that I, I, I can surmise what he was sitting in. But <laughs> right. yeah. a Raytheon product. So these would be surface to ground missiles or something. Yeah. yeah. He was able to say the words lightning, growler, and uh, buff. So. Right. <laughs> I can surmise those. <laughs> All right. Well, we're getting close here. I see people are piling into the waiting room. 13 yep. people anyway. It'll all come crashing in in just a second. Um, yeah, what I ought to do is have music playing in the background. kind of uh, <laughs> on yeah, What does the waiting room look like? I wonder. That's right. Waiting room. <laughs> the waiting room experience. Yeah, I was uh, trying to figure it out because I was going to talk about it, but uh, in my, I was trying to figure out when the first time that I went to Hiller was, and apparently um, my parents took me there in 1998. Oh, really? Wow. Whatever. <laughs> oh. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. So. Yeah, I remember once, I grew up in San Jose, but then I moved to Michigan and went to school out there for, for 30 years and worked out there. and completely lost connection with the Bay Area. And then once I was visiting my parents, you know, in the early 2000s or late 90s, and I drove by 101, it's like, what is this aviation museum doing here? How <laughs> did I know that someday I would come back, back to tr try to run it? So, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. So what's the ETA on the, uh, the Predator and the Black Fly? Well, you know, we were this close to just have, we went over there, picked out our black fly and, you know, hey, we'll just get it on a truck and get it over. And then, then the lockdown. And so they oh. completely, you know, dispersed their team and everything. And so it's like, well, we're get, they're going to have to wait until they can actually start whatever their operations are again before we get the airplane. So that's on hold. And the MQ-1 Predator, same thing. The, the U.S. Air Force people at the U.S. Air Force Museum in Dayton, who are the curators who run that, Thing for us, they're all furloughed, so they don't even answer emails. So, yeah, okay. you know, I, I they were supposed to come in for a site visit on in May here, and that that all fell through. So, you know, everything's gotten pushed back. Yeah, that's crazy. And we have it sitting in a crate in, in Monthan Air Force Base. You know, just it's in a crate. You know, and it's the one that they kind of designated for us. But, um, you know, we can't get it. Yet. Right. That's a shame. It's a big crate too. It's like a third yeah, that's huge long crate. <laughs> eight feet by 30 feet it's in a flatbed all right well i'm gonna screen share my shtick here so i'll do that um let's see here oh interesting i can see both i didn't realize i could see everybody's screen oh that's interesting okay i never knew that about co-hosting all right so are you seeing my screen share there? Yep. All right. Admit everybody, admit all.
And good evening, everybody. We're just gathering into the virtual auditorium here, and we're going to get rolling here in just a minute. <laughs> yeah, if you're just joining us, we're just gathering in. We'll give it another minute or so. So everyone who is still trying to get in out of the waiting room will be joining us shortly here and then we'll get underway. I'm sorry I don't have some nice waiting room music for you to listen to while we're waiting. <laughs> so that, that might be a feature that we come up with later. Elevator music. Okay, it looks like uh, I'll give it a, just another 30 seconds or so. Always takes a few minutes to get on. If Zoom is having a good night, which hopefully they are. All right, well, I guess we'll just sort of get this thing underway. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Hiller Hanger Talk. My name is Jeffrey Bass, and I'm going to be your host for tonight's uh, topic, which is designing airplanes from a lifetime obsession to a livelihood with Mark Van Bergen. Before we begin, though, I've got a couple of little announcements to make. Uh, we do have a, a Zoom etiquette that's going on during the talk. We've muted everybody uh, so that we don't have any background noises and feedback or anything going on. There are a lot of us in the room here, and uh, Mark will be able to give his talk. Uh, we will have time, though, after we're finished at, in about 30 minutes or so for questions and answers. So keep those in the back of your mind and use the chat feature to type in your question when you think of it, and then we'll be able to get to it when we do the questions and answers. And uh, Mark, you know, will be able to keep tabs on those uh, chat uh, questions as well. Now you can keep up to date with everything going on at the Hiller Aviation Museum, such as it is right now at www.hiller.org. We are closed uh, during the lockdown, but we do have a lot of programming that we're still presenting to folks. If you go onto our website, we have a page called Hiller at Home where we've got information about these Hiller talks that we have uh, coming up as well as other things uh, that you can do, downloading uh, special activities and you can watch videos and you can, we've got NASA simulators and other things that you can uh, download and explore all on our uh, Hiller at Home page. We have our series of Hiller Hangar Talks and coming up next week will be on Tuesday, May 26th at 7 p.m. in the evening, we will be welcoming Michelle Tripp, who's an airfield safety officer at SFO, not an airport safety officer. Her responsibilities are on the field uh, where the airplanes are. And that's an interesting perspective that she's gonna bring about uh, her career working at a busy airport. So that'll be next Tuesday with Michelle Tripp and we're really looking forward to as well, the week following in June, we were gonna, we're gonna be exploring more than 12 years of fabulous helicopter air shows that were hosted at the Hiller Aviation Museum Vertical Challenge with the guru behind them all, Willie Turner. So that is coming up in June. So a couple of hangar talks, you're gonna wanna pre-register for those when you go to our website at www.hiller.org. Okay, so that brings us to the best part of the night. And we have an intriguing story of a lifetime obsession designing airplanes. So let's welcome Mark Van Bergen. Take it away. Thanks, Jeff. Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen here to see the presentation and get that started. All right. All right. Is the presentation looking okay? Yeah, we can see it. Fantastic. 
All right, so my name is Mark Van Bergen, as Jeff said, um, and I'm going to be talking today a little bit about my experiences um, kind of getting into the aviation industry and my experience so far in the aviation industry. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the segment of the industry I'm in currently um, and uh, all the little intricacies and uh, fun parts and what I've enjoyed so far about it. Um, and then at the end, I'll take any questions that you guys may have and uh, we'll talk through it. Um, so a little about me, um, my current occupation is as a composite structures uh, design engineer. Um, I'm working at a company called Joby Aviation, um, which is a uh, EV toll uh, aircraft design company um, based out of Santa Cruz, California. Um, so I'm down here ne near the Hiller Aviation Museum. I'm in kind of the greater Bay Area. Um, I'm 25 and um, I've been in the industry um, proper. I've been out of school for uh, about a year now, um, but I've kind of been in the aviation industry my whole life. Um, and then I figured I'd throw in a favorite airplane because that's what we're talking about today. Um, so my favorite airplane of all time uh, that I haven't worked on um, is the de Havilland DH-88 Comet. Just got to put that in, otherwise my coworkers will criticize me. Alrighty, so where I started, um, I started very similar to a lot of people who are in the aviation industry. Um, I started liking airplanes from a really young kid. Um, in this, this previous picture, you can see me in the, uh, in the red sweatshirt um, at an air show inspecting the uh, Pogo landing gear of a AV-8 Harrier. Uh, so I, I started very young. Um, as long as I can remember, I've liked airplanes. Um, there, there's some stories in my family about being dropped on my head at an air museum, but we won't go into that. Um, so I started out um, kind of in the way that a lot of people uh, start out, which is going around to air museums, um, air shows, visiting uh, airplanes and doing everything they can. Um, my obsession turned into kind of a hobby and I started doing a lot of model building as a kid. Um, so I started out with just what I had available and tried to uh, learn as much as I could about airplanes. And it's a great way to get into the, to the industry and start learning about all the aircraft and the history of aircraft. Um, you can see one of my models uh, there. That's a, a zero that I made when I was in elementary school. And that model is made out of popsicle sticks and pop cans and uh, random spray paint that I had around the house because um, I was just too obsessed with aviation not not to build airplane models and that's what I had available. Um, and then you can see me there in front of a F4 Phantom when I was 10. Um, and then I knew pretty early on I wanted to be in aviation, um, but it was about middle school when I really learned what uh, aerospace engineering was. Um, and it was about in middle school that I decided that um, I, I wanted to kind of add my name um, to, to the list of people who have designed the airplanes throughout history. Um, so that's what I started pursuing. And the best way for me to pursue that in high school was um, a job working at a maintenance depot for, um, for, for small aircraft, for small general aviation aircraft. Um, so luckily enough, I had a friend who uh, was an a and mechanic um, which is an airframe and power plant mechanic working on uh, general aviation aircraft, um, kind of Cessnas, Pipers, uh, Lanceres, Cirruses, stuff like that. Um, so he let me come and uh, work for him for a little while. Uh, started out sweeping floors and uh, doing odd jobs around the shop and worked my way up to doing spark plugs and oil changes and uh, anything that, that he could sign off on that wasn't um, incredibly flight critical um, that, that he could check my work out on and, and sign off for the FAA. Um, so that's what I started uh, started my career in. That was my first job in aviation. Um, and it's a fantastic way to, to learn the inner workings of the airplane. Um, I still use lessons I learned in that job to this day. Um, so any chance you can get to... Uh, work on or with airplanes um, as early as you can um, is a, I found to be a fantastic way to, to get to know them. Um, from there, I started uh, working at air museums when I could get a chance. 
Um, so in high school, I did some research for the uh, Western Antique Aeroplane and Auto Museum. Um, and the, that, that's out in Hood River, Oregon, which was near where I was growing up. Um, and so in high school, I went out to their collection and, and got to do a bunch of research on aircraft engines and, and the aircraft themselves and, and write up some reports. I was able to get some class credit for that, but um, also got a chance to hang out with people at an air museum and um, get to learn a little bit more about the planes and a lot more about their engines. So um, that was a fun experience. And then across the field from the maintenance facility that I was working at, um, was another museum called Classic Aircraft Aviation Museum. Um, and I begged and pleaded with them until they let me come and, and help out there. So I worked giving tours and uh, helping out, you know, sweeping their floors and doing other stuff like that um, at their hangars. They focus mostly on flyable um, Cold War era aircraft. Um, so a lot of MiGs and they had a Jet Provost and Sabre and some other fun airplanes like that. And they flew about half of them. And the other half were always being worked on. Um, and it was, a, it was a fantastic museum to be a part of, to, to get to handle some uh, big heavy iron of aircraft and get to see that fly and operate. And so that was a good experience. And then while I was going through my master's program, um, I worked at the Hiller Aviation Museum. Um, on the weekends and uh, obviously I can't speak highly enough about the Hiller Aviation Museum. Um, Where did you go to school, Mark? <laughs> I'll, I'll get to that in a little bit, but I, I was going to Stanford at the time. Um, and so uh, working, working at Hiller was a really good way to uh, kind of apply what I was learning in, in school um, and get to see how people had applied it in the past. Uh, so again, I highly recommend Air Museums uh, at any age, they're they're a fun thing to to get to do, whether you're really young or um, at any age. So, um, worked at worked at those three museums, and I've kind of dabbled and helped out and visited a, at some other museums around around my life. But um, those are the main three. And then for for my academics, um, I went to Embry Riddle Aeronautical University um, for my undergrad. Um, to get my bachelor's of science in aerospace engineering. Um, I focused that uh, Embry-Riddle has a cool uh, balance where they can, you can either focus in aeronautical engineering, which is the designing of aircraft, um, or you can focus on, air, on uh, astronautical engineering where you can focus on designing uh, rockets and spacecraft. Um, so I tended more towards the, the aircraft side of it. Um, and it, it's a fantastic school. I went to the campus that's down in Prescott, Arizona. Um, went there for four years. Uh, they specialize in uh, aviation and all aviation related fields. Um, so they don't have uh, your normal college degrees, um, but they have, they specialize in aerospace engineering. They specialize in uh, aviation business, you can get your pilot certificate and uh, flight ratings from them if you want to go off and be a, uh, an airline captain um, and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, so I, I went the aeronautical engineering route because that's what I had always wanted to do. Um, at that school, there was a lot, of, a lot of side projects that I could get into um, and get some good hands-on experience with. Um, one of them is that l little yellow and black pointy thing down in the bottom. Um, that was a, a mock-up of a electric land speed car that uh, we got to help start a team on. Um, so we did some early preliminary design work for an electric land speed car uh, that was designed to go 250 miles per hour purely on electric uh, propulsion. Um, and that, that design is, is still being, being worked on and they're, they're building it right now. Um, so we're hoping to see it run uh, sometime in the next couple of years, uh, which is really exciting. Um, so that, that was one fun project I got to work on. Um, another one that is pictured here um, is an aircraft that we got to design as part of our senior design project. Um, Embry-Riddle does a really good job of, of uh, giving you the, the hands-on experience and getting you to get kind of a feel of 
uh, what, what the industry is going to be like. And so they had us take a design all the way from our teacher telling us what type of airplane he wanted um, and what that airplane needed to do. Um, we took that all the way through uh, wind, initial wind tunnel testing um, and got an idea of what our aircraft design would, would look like. Um, so our aircraft was a 14-passenger uh, a um, amphibious aircraft. Uh, it was designed to operate kind of in the, the Alaskan uh, bush and other places like that. Um, and so it's a, it's a flying boat, uh, kind of like the, the Grumman Albatross that's at the Hillary Aviation Museum. Um, ours, ours also was an amphibian, so it, was, it was, had retractable gear and... Um, it was quite a fun project to work on uh, and, and quite a cool experience to, to get to see something go from just kind of numbers into an actual shape of an aircraft and get to see it operate in the wind tunnel. Um, so after Embry-Riddle, uh, I went and I decided that I hadn't had enough of learning about airplanes um, and I wanted to, to learn a little bit more and I got, was lucky enough to get accepted at uh, Stanford University and went there for my master's school. Um, they do about a two-year master's program uh, in aerospace engineering. Um, and so I went through there and got to get taught by a lot of really, really, really impressive people. I um, got to learn a lot about the more theoretical and um, exploratory side of, of aviation. Um, and got to get a really good idea of how to uh, use the theory to push forward and, and, and find new, uh, develop new theories and develop new stuff that, that we don't even know of yet. So um, Stanford was a really good place um, for me. And I was lucky enough that, that Hiller was here to, to be a place for me to apply that. The project that you see down in the corner um, was a, a project I worked on uh, at Stanford, which was a subscale test of kind of an EV toll um, urban mobility design. Uh, so that's a quadcopter that we've, we've strapped some lightweight wings to. Um, and we wanted to get kind of a, a proxy stand in for um, an EV toll aircraft, which I'll talk about a little bit more later. Um, but the idea is to, to get something that can take off and land vertically. Uh, kind of like a helicopter, but when under flying, it's a lot more efficient um, as it uses its wings um, or some other other uh, surfaces. Um, and so in that, we, we did a full-scale test of what a system would be like to help guide these aircraft around, um, what a bidding system would look like if it was a rideshare operation, kind of like an Uber um, and other stuff like that. So we were able to get some pretty cool information on both what the aircraft would need to be uh, laid out like and what the whole system of landing and takeoff and operations and monetary costs and other stuff um, would need to be in order to uh, accomplish the goal of kind of a urban mobility uh, system. Um, so those, those were some fun projects um, that I did during my academics. Um, after that, uh, I went out into the, the aviation industry. Um, I worked at Cessna part-time as an uh, intern. And before that, I worked at uh, Volta Volare um, as an intern for a little while. Uh, Volta Volare was an uh, electric aircraft company. They were working on a hybrid aircraft, which you can see there, uh, the Volta Volare GT4. Um, so it was, a, it was a velocity airframe that they had developed their own power plant for. Um, and it was started out as a hybrid electric. And they were planning, we were working on a uh, fully hybrid powertrain. Um, so using only batteries and an electric motor to uh, propel the aircraft. Um, so I worked there for, I did an internship there for a summer, um, which was very informative um, and an interesting uh, view of kind of a very small company. There was about 10 of us total at that company. So, so that was a fascinating experience. Then I did an internship at, at Cessna um, down in Wichita, Kansas. Um, so Cessna is obviously one of the big names in aviation, uh, been around since the, the 20s. Um, 
And nowadays they're building private jets almost, almost exclusively. They've still got a couple of other small general aviation aircraft lines, but primarily they're building uh, private jets and a couple of uh, turboprop utility aircraft. When I was there, I worked in their tooling department, um, which was a fantastic experience to get to see what the uh, manufacturing side of the, the aviation design uh, problem looks like. So I worked on tooling for this aircraft that you see here, um, which is the Cessna Citation Longitude, um, which was at the time their largest uh, private jet that they had built. Um, now the latitude, I believe, um, has taken that crown. Um, but the the tooling side of things, Cessna is really unique in that they're one of the few companies that does almost all of their tooling design and, and construction in-house. Um, so they have uh, kind of a rare opportunity there to get to uh, get a feel for what that manufacturing effort looks like. Because it's one thing to design an airplane and get the shape. Um, but it's a whole nother thing to build a production line that builds a hundred of these a year. Um, and so, so that's what we were looking at. Um, and that was a fantastic experience there at Cessna. And then after, after my internships, um, I came out to Santa Cruz um, after my master's program and, and uh, was lucky enough to be hired at Joby Aviation um, down here. Um, Joby Aviation is designing and building that aircraft that you see in that picture, um, which is an eVTOL uh, aircraft. Here's a little bit more about Joby and another picture of their aircraft, our aircraft. Um, so that's a electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft designed to kind of be what we call an air taxi. Um, so it's meant to kind of uh, replace or uh, um, yeah, it's supposed to kind of replace uh, cars um, or augment them. Uh, but the, the idea is that's a, a four person or four passenger aircraft um, that is fully electric, um, takes off uh, vertically from pretty much anywhere that'll fit its size. And then um, from there it can transition to uh, a more efficient forward flight and fly longer distances than a helicopter could at faster speeds. Um, so we can make a uh, kind of air taxi system feasible. Um, lots of times people have tried the air taxi system with helicopters and helicopters just aren't quite feasible. They can't get the efficiency or the speed um, that it needs to bring the cost down to where an uh, average person can fly in it. Um, on that other picture, you'll see the, our entire company at Joby. Um, that's everybody standing in front of our aircraft. So it's still a small company. We've been around for about seven years um, and we're, we're growing larger as we design the aircraft. Um, so a little bit more about the, the EV toll and the urban mobility market um, that we're currently exploring. Um, so here, here's a, there's about a, 150 to 200 different companies that have claimed that they're a part of this urban mobility market, um, including Airbus, uh, which you'll see kind of in the upper right, uh, Lilium in the lower right, uh, Bell Helicopter kind of in the center, uh, Opener with their Black Fly aircraft down in the lower left, and then Kitty Hawk, or I believe they're called Whisk now, um, with that, that yellow aircraft there. So. Um, it's a, a fascinating problem to try to solve, um, to try to get an aircraft. Almost all of these are, actually all of these are fully electric. Um, and the, the idea to get an aircraft that's running on fully electric propulsion um, up into the air uh, vertically and then transition it to a more efficient form of flight um, and get it to traverse the distances needed all while trying to stay quiet, um, efficient, and cost-effective um, has been a, a, a really interesting challenge um, for a lot of companies to do. Um, at first, when I, when I was going through schooling and I started hearing about uh, these companies starting up, 
um, because it's it's only been pretty recently that the these aircraft companies that that are still working on the problem today um, have started. I was not um, fully aware of how cool the problem is. Um, and so I was a little bit skeptical about, about these, these aircraft. Um, but getting to know the field a little bit more, um, I found it to be a really interesting uh, place to be because it's, it's one of the few areas of aviation where we haven't reached upon a more or less convergent design. And it's one of the few areas of aviation where there's still um, radical designs coming out that are completely different from one another. Um, in a lot of other aspects of aviation, like airliners and fighter jets and um, general aviation aircraft, uh, the designs have more or less converged on, a, on one or two um, kind of basic shapes. Um, and it's, it's variations on a theme um, because those shapes are just the most efficient and the most effective and um, and, and we've kind of settled on those, but um, in the, the EV toll and the urban mobility market, um, it's still up for grabs on what is the most efficient shape. There's a lot of different schools of thought coming out and a lot of different solutions that other companies didn't think of. Um, and it's been a really interesting space to get to explore and get to design in because it's, it's very unique and every single person has a different solution um, to each individual problem uh, because all of these aircraft are trying to do stuff that only a handful of aircraft in the past have been able to do um, rather than than some of the large airliners and don't get me wrong there's still plenty of problems to solve in, in airliners and general aviation aircraft and and all of that um, and there, there's still large changes coming forward in that um, but the designs have uh, in terms of overall shape and layout of the aircraft have have more or less converged um, so that's been really interesting uh, for me to, to be a part of. And it's been interesting to get in um, kind of at the, at the start of this um, because the companies are, are still very small and uh, very, very active and very quick. So it's quick engineering. Um, within the first year, I had a, a part that was uh, to go on an airplane. Um, and... Uh, I've gotten some some amazingly fun experiences uh, in the design world to try to design these aircraft as quick as we need them to to be uh, sent out and prototyped. And there's a lot of iteration and prototyping going on uh, to try to get these aircraft uh, out as quickly as we can to to beat the competition. Um, and so the the uh, it's been a really really interesting industry. Um, segment to, to come out of school into um, and it's been a really fun one to, to get to learn from. Um, the other benefit I've, I've been lucky enough to have is a lot of the, um, the old hands in the industry um, are, are now finding that this is a, a, a fun part of the industry to be in and um, they're the ones that have all the, the experience where they're starting to solve these issues. Um, and so it's been a, a real pleasure for me to, to get to um, learn from them and uh, get to experience their solutions to the problems and um, get to gain a little bit of insight from, from what they're doing. I had a question for you, Mark. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully it might uh, resonate with some of the other questions that are forming in the chat box. Um, is it the case with these EVOL VTOL aircraft in the urban air mobility use that they pretty much have to pick a range that they're gonna operate in. It, it's not gonna be a one size fits all. Oh, I can hop from building to building or I could fly for 40 miles. It, are they gonna be that specialized that they really are good for only, you know, let's say three and four mile hops versus other aircraft in the same space, but different models and designs that might be better for, for longer distances or are they gonna be try to be made as versatile as possible? So it's interesting, there, there's, um, a lot of different schools of thought on that with, um, for, for instance, just on the aircraft that I have on this slide, um, the opener black fly down in kind of the lower left corner, um, it's a single person aircraft. Um, it's designed as an ultralight. So it's designed as more of a personal vehicle, um, kind of to replace a car or a motorcycle. Um, and so it, it's designed with pretty short range, um, but it's designed for a single person. Um, 
and and it's designed kind of as a, a replacement for for something fun to go around in. Um, and the the Cora aircraft, which is the, the yellow one here, um, it's designed as a two person vehicle, um, whereas the Airbus one is designed as a lot more than that. Um, so not only is there variation in terms of what ranges you're looking at, um, which is a huge thing, um, but also how many passengers you're going to carry um, and what you're trying to do, whether you're trying to be kind of uh, the replacement for buses or whether you're trying to be a replacement for a sports car or a motorcycle. Uh, but yeah, you're right. There, there is a lot of um, sp specialization um, within that. So there's, there's aircraft that are focusing just on operating within one city limit. Um, so flying inside San Francisco. Um, and then there's aircraft that are looking at flying maybe from San Francisco to Oakland or San Francisco to Santa Cruz. Um, and then there's aircraft that are looking at flying from San Francisco to LA um, and doing longer hops like that. So no one aircraft is going to be our a full solution for our, um, for all the mobility needs, right? It's going to be kind of a, a mix of a bunch of different companies' aircraft um, is, is how it's looking now because the design constraints are, are so large um, that you can really only design an aircraft for a specific purpose. Um, that being said, some of the, some of the designs are, are designed to be a little bit more versatile and a little bit um, uh, larger of an envelope. Um, but there's drawbacks to that as well. Nancy Rose had a question that was also on my mind, which is, you know, when are we going to start to see these aircraft? Um, obviously, there's issues with the infrastructure for controlling them and FAA certification and air traffic and all of that. What are your thoughts about the time frame when we're going to start seeing, you know, the first companies rolling these out? Yeah, so um, a lot of the, the prototypes are, are starting to fly um, now. We've got um, I think there's at least six different companies that have uh, documented flyable prototypes. Um, there's some, some are already doing demos. Um, there's one or two that are able, uh, that are uh, flying humans at this point. Um, I don't think anybody has yet taken a passenger as far as I know. Um, but it's, it's, it's really soon that we're going to start seeing this. Um, some people have speculated that within around the next five years, um, we're going to start seeing uh, early ride options available. Um, they're probably not going to be super cheap. Um, they're probably not going to be super uh, uh, available. They're not going to be at every city in, in the world. Um, but there, there will be kind of test operations up and running um, sometime within the next five years, I would say. Is, is what a lot of people. Uh, let me take a look at some of the. Yeah, go ahead and jump in on those. Um, I'm, I'm also mindful too of the market in China it seems to be very aggressive in terms of developing urban air mobility. So is that yeah, the so, center? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, there's um, companies like Ehang uh, in China um, right. that are doing some really, really interesting stuff. Um, Ehang's aircraft is kind of a, um, a version of an octo octocopter, um, and theirs is very much uh, more focused on uh, inside the city, so intracity um, uh, travel. And so that uh, the companies like Bem and Volocopter and some other uh, other designs are kind of focused more on that. And so you'll see them resembling more of a helicopter, um, more of a uh, electric helicopter rather than an electric. Uh, airplane, because um, that works better in kind of a smaller scale. Um, so I think Ethan asked, uh, how quickly can you build small aircraft like these eVTOLs? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, aircraft inherently are a lot harder to build and a lot slower to build than, um, than cars. Um, and that's mainly due to a lot of the constraints um, and a lot of the uh, the, the perfection level that you need to get to with aircraft. Um, if your car's body panel falls off, um, it's, it's a bummer and you're gonna need to take it into a shop. Um, but if an aircraft body panel falls off, you've got a huge safety issue for 
um, for your flight. Um, and so aircraft are built to a, a really high level um, of, of perfection. And so um, they take a little bit longer to build. Um, what we're going to need to do for eVTOL though is to ramp that up. And so there's a lot of technology coming out uh, to make that manufacturing even quicker um, and to make the manufacture of aircraft uh, much faster. And so uh, some companies are quoting um, multiple thousands of aircraft being built a year. Um, Ehang has already built um, quite a few of theirs. Um, there's some pretty impressive pictures out there of, of a whole fleet of them sitting around. Um, so these aircraft are being are starting to be designed to be built really quickly because we need a lot of them if we're going to try to replace cars. Um, all right, let's see. Why does it? Why does the aircraft in the bottom right corner look like it? It's a ton of jet engines. Do these burn electricity? From Nancy Rose. Um, so that's a really interesting design on the Lilium. Um, so it they're calling theirs um, jets. Um, what they actually are are ducted fans. Um, so ducted fans are uh, a design to where you take a, a smaller propeller, um, looks more like a, a, a fan you would have uh, sitting on your desk to cool you down on a hot day. Um, and they, they put them inside a duct, which increases the efficiency of the airflow through that fan. Um, and so they spin their little fans really quickly and generate a whole lot of thrust from them. Um, and so they have what's called a distributed um, thrust system where their entire wing um, is covered in these really small fans. Um, and so you can see, I think there's like 11 on each wing. Um, and so that's how they produce their, their lift thrust is uh, with all, all these really small fans um, that they then tilt down towards the ground. Um, so um, they are just, just ducted fans, they're not jet engines, um, but they work in a, in a kind of a similar way and they look very similar. The, the Bell aircraft, is that the blue one at the bottom? Yes, the, the Bell aircraft is the, the middle one. Um, are, those, so called... are those ducts basically ring wings as opposed to the ducted fans on the, the other one that you were talking about? Yeah, so, so those, um, those, are, those are ducted uh, as well, uh, much larger ducts and much larger fans. Um, so there's some benefits in terms of acoustics, um, which so the sound level that the propellers are producing, which is one of the big constraints on these, um, because people don't want a helicopter landing, you know, in their backyard um, to drop them off or pick them up. Um, that would drive pretty much everybody crazy if we replaced every car with a helicopter. Um, so we're trying to make these as quiet as possible. And so one of the things like Bell is doing there. Um, is ducting around the fans. Um, there's also a lot of design going into the propeller blades. Um, so you can see on the uh, Kitty Hawk aircraft, the yellow one, um, all those little fan blades that are strapped under the wing, um, they, ha they don't look like any other propeller you've probably ever seen. And that's because they're designed uh, with acoustics in mind, trying to keep them as quiet as possible. Um, so. That's a little bit about why the why the bell is shaped that way. Um, the bell also has uh, wings, um, but it does, we believe, generate some lift from from that ducted fan as well. Um, alrighty, there's a question here. Are are there plans to get Joby's airplanes to be quieter and compete better against Kitty Hawk and Heavy Side, um, which is a hundred times quieter than a regular helicopter? Uh, this may help for closer residential use. So yeah, just like I was talking about. Um, we're trying to keep them as quiet as possible. Um, so we're all striving to be quieter than the next person. Um, and I can't talk to specifics about, about the Joby design, um, but I can tell you that it's amazingly quiet. Um, and it, it's, a, it's a really, really, really cool, uh, a lot of really cool solutions that have been put into designing the acoustic side of it. Um, so what is the design reasoning for a small aircraft to not have an airplane parachute um, for the whole plane available. You automatically open when a plane stalls and goes into a nosedive. Um, all right, so yeah, airplane parachutes or uh, ballistic uh, recovery chutes or BRSs um, are a really cool addition that's come out um, pretty recently in terms of aviation. Um, and the idea, um, for those of you who aren't familiar, is when an airplane goes out of control, you have this uh, option where you can push a button and a little rocket shoots a, uh, a parachute 
out of your aircraft. Um, and that, that parachute uh, is large enough to carry the whole aircraft down to the ground safely. Um, and so the idea is if you run out of fuel, your engine dies, um, or if you get into kind of a, a place where you can no longer control the aircraft, you can use this chute to, to bring you back down to the ground safely. Um, they're a great option that's being applied on a bunch of general aviation aircraft. Um, and I know a lot of the, the eVTOL aircraft are also looking at using them as an option. Um, there's been some issues with them, and there's some reasons that people wouldn't put them on their own aircraft. Um, one of them is, is it adds weight, it adds uh, stuff inside of your airplane, um, and it, they are expensive. Um, so those are kind of the, the three general reasons for, for everything on an aircraft, airplane. Um, what you can fit in your airplane, what you can carry in your airplane, and how much your airplane is going to cost. Um, and then the, the other problem with them is um, when, when, when you have a, a backup system, um, you're never quite as uh, careful about your primary system. Um, and so there's, there's been issues where, where pilots have used their backup system uh, a little bit too much as a primary system and, uh, and have relied on it too much and not focused on, on flying themselves. Um, now, in, in my personal opinion, I think they're, they're a great thing uh, to put on an aircraft. Um, and I think they, they do save quite a few lives um, in the, the eventuality that, uh, the, that you need them, that an airplane goes out of control or uh, has some sort of failure. Uh, and then there's another question. What's the hardest part of development on a new Joby aircraft or EV tolls in general? Um, for example, increasing range, SF to LA, um, or the plane at a reasonable price point. Yeah, so um, one of the hardest things we found in developing is working around the, the electric platform. The electric platform gets you a whole lot of really beneficial stuff, and it's what makes um, EV toll really possible, and what makes a small scale VTOL possible, um, which is vertical takeoff and landing. Um, it allows you to have an amazing amount of control um, you can control each propeller individually, and it's what allows an aircraft like Lilium to have 11 propellers per wing, um, which is just an amazing amount. But it also has a lot of issues. Um, we're not anywhere near as energy dense as gasoline, um, so you have to be a lot more efficient with your energy that you do have. Um, and the battery weighs a lot, and it weighs that exact same amount through all portions of flight. Um, one of the, the interesting things with electric aircraft versus uh, combustion aircraft, combustion engine aircraft, in a combustion engine, you're burning off your fuel weight throughout your entire flight. So your airplane is only getting more efficient as it flies. Um, whereas with an electric aircraft, um, those electrons that you're burning um, don't weigh hardly anything. So um, the weight of your aircraft at the start of the flight and the weight of the aircraft at the end of the flight um, should be almost exactly the same. And so you, your aircraft doesn't get more efficient as it flies, so you need to try to keep it as efficient as possible throughout the entire flight. Um, and so that's one of the, uh, the issues that, that has been most prevalent um, with, with the battery technology. And since that battery technology is so much heavier than gasoline, we have to do a whole lot of other stuff with the aircraft to try to get the rest of it as light as possible. Um, to, to balance out for that battery weight. All right, um, let's see the other. Uh, so will there be stations where you can rent EV tolls? Um, so that's a really good question. That's still to be determined, kind of how society figures out that infrastructure. Um, the idea most companies are going on right now is something kind of like a uh, ride sharing model. Uh, so there'll be companies similar to Uber or Lyft um, that have all the aircraft and operate all the infrastructure. Um, and then you use an app and say, I need an aircraft to pick me up at my nearest uh, EV toll station and take me to this other EV toll station. Um, and then there will be an aircraft there waiting for you. You hop in and we take you to the next area, um, wherever you need to go. Um, and so that's kind of the model that people are looking at right now. Um, that's kind of the most prevalent one. It won't be necessarily a personally operated vehicle um, you're probably not going to have one of these in the garage um, just because all those engineering things that we're doing, um, they're expensive. 
And so these are going to be really expensive aircraft. And so it's prohibitively expensive for most people to own one. And so other than something like Black Fly, um, where that, that's a more personal vehicle, most of these are going to be operated by, by a company. Well, we're reaching the end of our talk, and I, I think you were able to catch uh, a lot of the questions there. So thanks for uh, doing that, Mark. Um, what's your favorite part of this whole design process of eVTOLs? What's, what's the coolest thing for you? Oh, uh, the coolest thing um, has been seeing the, the, the parts that I design and, and come up with on a, on a computer um, and, you know, start out as numbers uh, to see them actually get manufactured, um, put through that whole manufacturing process I was talking about and end up as actual parts that are ready to go on an aircraft is just a really, really amazing thing to see. Um, and to, to see that aircraft actually go out and operate um, is just quite, quite a treat um, when, when you know you've had a part on it even, no matter how small of a part it may be, um, it's, it's really, really amazing to, to see something go out and operate with your part on it. Well, that sounds really cool. We're looking forward to seeing that Joby aircraft. One thing that I think I really like about the Joby aircraft is it looks pretty. I mean, it's a, it's a good looking aircraft. Some of these sort of hexacopters look a little like they just don't look elegant, you know, or they, but the Joby aircraft looks really nice. It's a, it's a pretty airplane. Every home yeah, we're, <laughs> we're quite proud of it. And uh, we, we're trying to make it as beautiful as possible. So. Excellent. Well, I'd like to thank Mark Van Bergen for his talk tonight. And if you want to show your appreciation, you can uh, scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom window where it says reactions and you can give him a rousing round of applause as I just did or a thumbs up. So thank you, Mark Van Bergen. We really appreciate that you came and joined us tonight to share your experience with your obsession designing airplanes. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you everybody for tuning in. Thank you, everybody. And we're going to be meeting here again next week to meet with Michelle Tripp. Every takeoff and touchdown starts at an airport, and that'll be on Tuesday, uh, a week or so from now at 7 o'clock. So until then, stay safe, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you at the next Hiller Hangar Talk. Good night, everybody. long farewell. <laughs> <laughs> Our regulars are here. That's cool. It's good to see a lot of you coming back. So we're going to do this again next week. Hey, Roger. Good to see you. Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs> Steve, thanks. Lynn, everybody. I always hate pulling the plug at the end, so I'll, I'll let everybody in a uh, more elegant exit. All right, well, thank you, Mark. So I'll, uh, we'll be in touch. I'll send you the uh, recording. Sounds good, thanks, Jeff. Great, well done, sir, thank you. Yeah.